Great. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about garden strategies to control pests and diseases. So I'm going to talk about both pests and diseases. But of course, my background is in plant pathology, so I will have a bit of an emphasis on diseases. Um, so what we'll talk about today is different kinds of pests, pests and more pests. There's plenty out there. A little bit about healthy plant basics, symptoms and signs of diseases, the plant disease triangle, which is a concept in plant pathology, a little bit about the history of disease and pest control, how things evolved. And then I want to spend some time talking about integrated pest management. This is really the best way to manage things in your garden. Uh, the disease management principles, IPM, integrated pest management control measures and tactics, a brief summary, and I'll give you some information at the end. So who are we? We are gardeners. And what do we want? We all want all the plants. And where do we put them? Well, we don't know, but wherever it is that we put them, we do want them to be healthy. Um, so the definition of pests are organisms that damage or interfere with desirable plants. There can be vertebrates, uh, including birds, rodents, deer, and other mammals. They can be invertebrates, which include insects, mites, snails. Weeds are also pests. Weeds can steal nutrients and water from desirable crops and plants. They can outshade them. So weeds are certainly types of pests. And then a large category of pests is plant pathogens. Plant pathogens are organisms that include a, a number of different types of organisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, nematodes, mycoplasms, and, and a bunch of other kind of strange names for things that they keep discovering. Um, this here is a schematic of a plant cell. So it's blown up very large, and I'm sorry that it's a little bit blurry, but it shows the relative size of various plant pathogenic organisms in relationship to the size of the plant cell. Now, characteristic of most plant pathogens is that they are microscopic, not all, but most. Um, and this, one of the larger ones is the nematode. This is just the head of a nematode sticking in the cell. This is a thread of mycelium called a hyphae, which is part of the fungus, fungus thread that is in the cell. And on their own, these things are microscopic. Of course, when mycelium is in mass or they form fruiting bodies, such as mushrooms or something, you can see them with the naked eye. Um, much smaller are bacteria. They are quite tiny. You cannot see an individual bacterium with the naked eye. You need a microscope. There are other things called molecules and protozoans. And then we have the really tiny organisms, if you want to call them that, um, or pathogens, these, these are the viruses. The viruses and viroids are so small that they can only be seen with an electron microscope. They can't even be seen in a regular microscope. So they're very, very small. So that said, what is a plant disease? Why is this a little bit different than just a regular type of pest that you have in your yard? Well, the definition of a plant disease is a malfunctioning of host cells and tissues that results from a continuous irritation by a pathogenic agent and leads to development of symptoms. Um, there are also environmental diseases caused by things such as calcium deficiency, which gives you blossom end rot. We are not going to focus on that today. Today we're talking about actual pests. But one thing that distinguishes uh, pathogens from other types of pests is this fact that it is in affecting the host at the cellular and tissue level. When you have an insect come in and chomp on your plant, they're just eating it away or sucking out the juices, whereas the plant pathogens are actually causing the host cell to have a specific type of response. And this is from this continuous irritation. It's important to know what a healthy plant does because you want to make sure that what you're looking at is indeed part of a problem and not not something that's normal for the plant. Someone just last week said to me, oh, look at these funny things growing on this plant. What, what's wrong with it? Well, they were just the uh, leaf sheaths uh, or the, the bud coverings that were, were falling off and being dead, you know, as they get shed from the plant. 
but they looked funny being on there, but that was normal, very normal for that particular plant. So plants do sometimes have strange structures on their own. So you want to make sure that you know what's normal for your plant. Now plants have various types of metabolic and physiological activities that occur. They pro synthesize proteins, the roots uptake water and minerals and translocate them throughout the plant. It's transpiration comes out, water vapor out the leaves. You've got photosynthesis going on, converting light and carbon dioxide into complex carbohydrates. You've got reproduction going on with fruits and flowers. And all these things are normal functions in the plant. Uh, plants also produce secondary uh, compounds such as vitamins and hormones and synthesize all kinds of proteins. Well, when you have disease, these, these different functions are interfered with. Root rot will prevent the roots from uptaking minerals and water. Different types of leaf uh, blights and wilts will prevent photosynthesis. Fruit, fruit rots will prevent reproduction. So the plant has only so many ways that it can actually respond to these things, but they are numerous depending on what type of part is, is affected. And these are some examples of symptoms. I've grouped them by the different types of organisms, just so you can see that different organisms can cause different characteristic symptoms. And sometimes this is very helpful in diagnosing what your problem is. You might have fungi that give you a very specific type of leaf spot on a particular plant, and you will know immediately what's causing your problem. But in general, there are uh, categories. Um, so for example, viruses very often have this mosaic pattern that they cause with this yellowing, which is called chlorosis. They can have crinkled leaves and stunting. Nematodes have similar symptoms, but when you look at them in the field, it's, it's very often very characteristic that you know that this type of pattern is caused by a nematode. And so you can have leaf spots, uh, galls and cankers and other sorts of things. Hyperplasia is an overgrowth of tissue. But again, the plant has very limited ways that it can actually respond to these various organisms, but sometimes they can be characteristic and key you into identifying the problem. Another thing that can help you out is a sign of a disease. And this is another way that pathogens differ from other types of, of um, pests in general. Um, obviously, insects you can see on the plant, but very frequently there are characteristic signs. And this is the physical evidence of the pathogen that you actually see the pathogen there. Now, you recall I told you that bacteria cells were microscopic and could only be seen with a microscope. However, if you've got a bad infection, such as this, this fire blight here on this apple, where there are so many bacteria, they're just oozing out, this ooze actually is a visualization of millions of bacteria. So you can see them under certain conditions. Fungi are often visible as spores on the leaves. Some very characteristic ones are powdery mildew, which indeed looks very powdery, and leaf rust, which is a characteristic orange um, powdery look on that looks like rust on the leaves. So those are very characteristic to identify. Nematodes, sometimes a particular nematode called a root knot nematode can be seen on the roots of plants that are infected by it. Now, viruses, there are no signs because not only are they microscopic, they're submicroscopic, so you do not see any signs. But these signs can also help you clue you in as to what you need to do to control your problem. I want to take a few minutes to talk about an important concept in plant pathology, which is the plant disease triangle. And this is another factor that differentiates diseases from other types of pests. With other pests, you just have to have a susceptible host and the pest, and you're gonna have a problem when they come together. But with diseases, you have this additional factor, which is the favorable environment. This environment must also be present for a specific amount of time for that disease to develop. For example, spores of fungus may land on a leaf of a susceptible host, 
and the weather may be great and it's sunny and nothing's going to happen. You get a brief rainstorm, you still may have nothing happen, but you may have it rain for four hours. Ah, that's enough time for that, that spore to germinate and infect the plant. So these things must come together in order for disease to develop. And it's important to understand this because this can also help clue you in as to ways to interfere with this pattern and provide different types of control to prevent disease in your yard. I want to take a few minutes to talk about the history of disease and pest control. I thought it was pretty interesting. It really took us a long time to get a clue as to what was going on. The first farmers just, they knew they had pests on their diseases, I mean, pests on their plants. Um, and so they were like, they didn't have any control over it. So they just made sure to plant enough so that they could basically share and have enough to survive for themselves. In 2500 BC, the Sumerians discovered about sulfur compounds and that was great for killing a lot of pests. But it wasn't until over 2000 years later that some new concepts evolved. Um, these included timing crops to avoid pests, evasion, and this is still used today, and employing natural pest enemies or biocontrol, and this is also still used today. In 1100 AD, so another more than 1,000 years goes by, soap was discovered as a pesticide that this could kill soft-bodied insects. In the 1600s, they started getting an idea that they could use things that were toxic to insects. And these included uh, infusions from tobacco, herbs, and arsenic. So compounds that actually came from plants, because plants do have mechanisms to control diseases themselves. They're just not always uh, fully 100% effective, but some plants are able to produce compounds that, that can prevent disease. And so these were then put on other plants. So that was kind of a new discovery at that time. Um, in the 1800s, a lot of imperial expansion occurred where we were certainly in the United States was, was spreading out West. Other expansions were going around the world. They were spreading crops to take with them. And they noticed that when they spread the crops, they were also spreading problems. And this led to the concept of inspections and quarantine procedures or exclusion. And again, something that is still used today. At that time, uh, they became more interested. They started understanding that there were ways to control pests. And so lime sulfur was first then used to control plant disease. So things were starting to evolve. In 1853, Anton de Berry, who's considered the father of modern mycology, actually established that fungi are the cause of plant diseases and not the result. Fungi cause more plant diseases than any other type of pathogen. And a lot of the times they thought that this was sort of a symptom of the disease itself. And now they realize that that was actually the cause. So um, more types of mixtures were developed to control beetles. Robert Koch in 1879 actually established the germ theory about diseases in animals were caused by microorganisms. So this was a huge step ahead in understanding what was going on. Bordeaux mixture, I think many of you might've heard of this, was developed to control downy mildew on grape and has been used on a number of different plant problems. But it wasn't until really relatively uh, recently in the scheme of agriculture, that synthetic pesticides were developed. This was in 1939, and this was thought to be the end of all problems. It's kind of like when they discovered antibiotics. Things were great. They controlled diseases, you'd spray it on the plants, you'd, you'd get rid of your insect problems and your pest problems. But in the 1960s, they started having resistance occur. So what happens when you get resistance? Well, you have your pests that are eating on your plant, and you spray this magical new formula, chemical formula, and voila, your, 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 your problem is gone. But what you're not realizing, or what they didn't realize at the time, was that a few individuals were surviving because of resistance to that particular pesticide. They had some kind of genetic characteristic 
that allowed them to somehow survive being attacked by that particular pesticide. There are probably also others, other susceptible uh, pests that were not even coming in contact with the pesticide. So they survived as well. So they still made up some of the population. And so the next year when you sprayed, you still got pretty good control because you were killing off some more of the susceptible ones. But now you've got more and more percent of the population becoming resistant. And then all of a sudden it appears that all of the pests are surviving and not being affected by the pesticide. So at that time we say that the resistance has been broken. And basically what happened was they said, well, we need to make a new better formula, a new, new compound that will have more effect. And so sort of this garden warfare going on where you create stronger chemicals and then they over get overcome and it was just uh, becoming a huge problem. In the 1960s, Rachel Carson came out with her book, Silent Spring. And this book, this study that she did, she found that not only were we getting resistance, but non-target organisms were being affected. The environment was having problems because of our spraying of these terrible chemicals out there. And so this, this created a new awareness and the scientists thought about what we could do. And that's when they came up with this idea of integrated pest management. This was first suggested by entomologists because insects were the first ones where they had this resistance problem and they uh, came up with ideas. And this has now been extended to all different types of pest populations from weeds to diseases and other, other problems. It goes by many names, um, integrated pest management, integrated disease management, integrated pest control. It all basically means the same thing, is that you're taking a knowledge-based approach about pests and their life cycle and the life cycle of your hosts, cultural practices, using non-chemical methods as well as pesticides to manage pest problems. So that was one definition. And then I like this other definition as well, it goes a little bit deeper. Um, it tells you the different components. That One, you're trying to optimize what you're doing. You want to take care in both an economic manner and an ecological manner. And you're gonna be using multiple coordinated tactics to make sure you get the stable outcome and to maintain damage at or below an acceptable in injury level while minimizing hazards to humans, animals, plants, and the environment. So Joni Mitchell said it best, give me spots on my apples, but leave me the birds and the bees, please. It's that same kind of concept. The goal of IPM is to reduce the adverse impacts of pest control. So you're not totally 100% limit, eliminating all the pests but you want to reduce the adverse impacts on human health, the environment and non-target organisms while managing pests effectively and reducing the evolution of pest resistance to pesticides and other pest management practices. So in other words, by implementing these various techniques, you're going to take some of the pressure um, off those insects to select for only those that are resistant. So you don't create this problem where you're overcoming uh, resistance to your different methods so quickly. The steps of IBM include monitoring, where you go out and you monitor your environment and perhaps even sample for a pest population. Once you find a pest, you make sure you get it properly identified, both the type of damage and what, what the pest is. And you want to know about pest and host life cycle and biology because that will help you determine ways to control it. You then assess whether you actually need to take action at this time. Um, you might accept some spots on your apples or your iris or whatever. Um, frequently, I get aphids on my iris. That's, I'm not gonna bring out the spray. I'm just gonna spray them down with a the hose. That, that's often enough of an action to take care of the problem. You're going to implement then that, that appropriate strategy or strategies um, and implement maybe a combination of management tactics to see what works. 
And an important step of IPM is evaluation, making sure that you can determine what worked and what didn't work, and also making note of that um, so that the next time it happens, you know whether to take different action or to take action sooner. I want to just mention a little bit about the traditional management principles for healthy plants. And these are very similar to what's used in IPM with the kind of exceptions that when these were first introduced, they were looked at individually as each one was a separate way. And now we're looking at them more as an integrated process. But these different management principles included avoidance, exclusion, eradication, protection, therapy, and resistance. Avoidance and exclusion are similar. Basically, you're trying to just keep the pathogen or pest away from your crop. And this is done in plant pathology. Um, as I mentioned early or late planting dates can be a great way to avoid the pest. You know they're coming. So you try to time your crop in order to avoid when the pests are going to be there. Another way is to make sure that you're starting healthy with pathogen-free propagating material. And farmers can do this by buying clean seed. And that clean seed is grown in particular environments that don't have the pathogen. For example, they can grow beans out in the West where it's very dry and certain diseases just aren't present. So they know that when those seeds are distributed to the farmers, that those seeds are going to be disease-free for particular diseases. Similarly, potatoes can be grown in an area that lacks a vector that spreads a particular disease. And in those environments, that vector is not present. So they can, again, grow clean seed for potatoes. Exclusion is a little bit different. This is actually using a way to keep the disease or pest from contacting the plant. Uh, for example, using row covers will uh, prevent uh, aphid vectors from getting to that plant and spreading certain viral diseases. Quarantine and inspection is an important way of keeping diseases out of your yard, another type of exclusion. And this is where you prevent, again, at the borders, and this can be done on a country, state, or garden level, where... Um, in the country, if you've ever come through an airport, they often ask you if you've been to any agriculture sites or if you're carrying any fruit with you. They wanna make sure that they're keeping things from coming in the country. Uh, statewide uh, programs are also in place. Uh, Hawaii and California obviously have very strong programs to safeguard their particular crops and agriculture industry. And you can do this in your own garden as well. When you buy a plant that's new that you're going to introduce to your yard, you want to inspect it to make sure that you're not introducing any insects in the soil or any look at the leaves, making sure that they look healthy. And if it's something that you've got other things already in your yard, you might want to observe it for a few weeks before you actually plant it to make sure that it is disease free. Eradication is actually eliminating the pest or pathogen after it's established or eliminating the plants that carry the pathogen. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, protection and therapy are similar in that they both involve chemical methods and uh, they differ a little bit in that protection is when you can spray something on your plant to prevent the problem from happening. And of course, not all, there's not, not chemicals available for everything for that. Um, so sometimes you might have to resort to therapy and this is spraying something that will cure your plant or treat your plant. And again, there's not therapies available for all diseases or pests. Resistance is long considered the gold standard. If your plant is not affected by pests or diseases, then hey, you're, you're home free pretty much. And if you've ever bought tomatoes that have a designation that says VFN on it, that stands for verticillium, fusarium, and nematodes. And those are three diseases or three pathogens that have been resistance, have been bred into those varieties of tomatoes. And so they are not affected by them. 
Unfortunately, this does not apply to a lot of heirloom tomatoes. So those, those pests can still be problems on um, certain select tomato varieties. But again, resistance in general is certainly something that can be strived for. Now, the IPM tactics are similar. Um, they include cultural methods, physical and mechanical methods, chemical, biological, and genetic. And these are similar, but I'm gonna go over these again. So cultural practices really, to me, is the key thing that you can do in your yard to make sure that things are healthy. What you basically do is minimize the condi conditions pests need and maximize the conditions to make your plant succeed. So for example, if you know that a certain pest lives in debris where they can overwinter or multiply, you wanna get rid of that. If you have the right plant in the right place, you have the right light, the right soil type, plants that are adapted to growing here in the South, um, and you provide them with proper water and nutritional needs and proper spacing, this is an issue that a lot of people often overlook, those are things that can help your plants succeed. Spacing can be important because plants that are competing for nutrients or even air movement can, can change the environment around that plant to make it susceptible to certain diseases or problems. So, so those are things to consider. But the bottom line is that strong plants resist diseases. They outgrow weeds and are less likely to succumb to insect pests. And just think about this in your own personal health. When you're healthy, you can, and you're getting enough sleep and you're not staying up late and you're eating properly, you're able to resist things that may um, affect you otherwise. But if you're run down, you're just certainly more susceptible to catching a cold or other diseases. So plants are the same way. When they're growing happily, they are much stronger. I said I'd mention a little bit about host eradication. And this is just a case of where you're trying to reduce inoculum so it won't infect other plants. And this can be done if you notice disease on a plant, you can actually cut it out and destroy that particular infected branch in some cases. In some cases, it might have to be the entire plant. Sometimes you've seen where you have a row of trees in a row where one at the end is infected by some kind of disease and you see it sort of traveling down the row. And unfortunately, the thing to do is to remove the diseased plants so that the other plants won't get it from that um, other plant. So sometimes that is the best way. Crop rotation is another way if you're growing things um, in your yard where you've got a nematode problem, for example, you can plant things that are resistant or a fungal, a soil fungus, um, or even some insects that are growing on specific crops or plants. When you plant something that's not susceptible, that organism will tend to die out over time. Sometimes it takes a few years for that soil to become available to grow your desired plant or crop again. Sometimes never, because certain plants or on um, certain diseases have broad host ranges that can affect a lot of different kinds of plants. But that is one way to help reduce inoculum. Sanitation. Um, my favorite example, I do this every year, is I grow camellias in my yard. And if you make sure to pick up the spent blooms, you will reduce the chances of spreading camellia blight a petal blight on your flowers for the next year. And it's very easy to do. You just go out and you pick them up and you throw them away. Um, because what happens is that fungus lives in those dead tissues and that's where it will survive the adverse conditions until the next spring where it can splash up onto your plants. So sanitation is a very important method for um, helping keep your, your yard healthy. And just in general, creating unfavorable conditions for pests. Mulching is great. Obviously, if you mulch, you know that it's so much easier to control weeds. And this can also actually help control some diseases as well. It helps prevent splashback onto the plant when you have mulch underneath. <laughs> some other IPM control measures include things that are mechanical or physical. 
These include uh, sticky traps that can attract uh, different types of flying insects or uh, other barriers like this net, which can prevent deer or rabbits from getting to your tender, tender seedlings. Other types of physical mechanical methods may include actually just removing them by either traps or vacuuming or mowing them away. This is a picture of an azalea. I had this same problem last year. I went out in my yard, I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to my azalea plant? And I looked at it and then I looked a little more closely and I saw these little critters. And I didn't know what they were. Obviously they're caterpillars, but I, I just snapped a photo of them. I like to use Google Lens and Google Photos and just kind of click on it. And it immediately told me they were azalea caterpillars. And so I looked up about them. And really the best control is picking them off. This is not fun, but it, it's very easy. I put on a pair of gloves and I went out and I picked them off and I squished them and I got rid of them. And that was the end of the problem. Well, not exactly. I still did that monitoring step. I went back a few days later to see if I had gotten them all. And sure enough, there were a few more, got rid of them. And then my azalea was happy after that. So the next type of control is biological control. And this is just what the name says. This is employing beneficial organisms, whether they're predators, parasites, or to other diseases of the pest themselves in a targeted way to suppress specific pest populations. You can do this by encouraging natural populations that are already present in your yard. Uh, ladybugs can help control those aphids on your iris. Um, and so um, you want to avoid harming these beneficial organisms. So you want to avoid spraying mosquito sprays or other things around your yard so that you don't get those non-target insects as well. So you encourage them. Uh, you can augment naturally occurring species uh, by purchasing and releasing them into, the, into your yard. There are a lot of different um, types of organisms that are available for sale. And they're also developing new species um, that can be um, introduced. These are some examples of biocontrols. You can buy this uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a type of bacterium that controls different types of caterpillars. There are different subspecies of bacillus that controls different types of larvae. So this one's for caterpillar control. You can also get these mosquito dunks. These are very effective at killing uh, mosquitoes in water sources. So if you've got a, a little pond or a fountain that you can put these in and when the mosquito lays their eggs and the larvae develop, the bacteria will infect them and kill them off. This is just an example of a natural predator that occurs, tomato hornworm that can chew up your tomatoes are parasitized by a certain type of wasp and the wasp lays its eggs in the caterpillar. Those eggs hatch, it forms pupae. These are not actual eggs, these are the, the pupae or larvae that are coming out and um, they will eat that caterpillar from the inside out. And that's just a natural control to keep down the population of those hornworms. You can also use suppressive soils. And basically a suppressive soil is a soil that has lots of beneficial organisms, microorganisms growing in it that will help to keep the bad guys in check. So you want to make sure you have healthy soils. Um, some things that you can do to encourage that is, again, using organic matter in your soils on, on the top to improve them. You want to um, uh, reduce the amount of uh, fertilizer, not to over fertilize because salt and fertilizers can inhibit some of the beneficial microorganisms. So just want to do, again, good cultural practices to help build up healthy, happy microorganisms in your soil. Trap plants are another biological control. A lot of people have heard marigolds for, for different uses. Marigolds, lavender, and nasturtium can act as trap plants to attract slugs, beetles, thrips, nematodes, and whiteflies. 
Marigolds also actually exude things into the soil that can inhibit a lot of soil problems. Some soil fungi and nematodes can be inhibited by growing marigolds. So that's another way that you can use them as a biological control. And of course, there's still chemical control. Uh, while we try to avoid overusing chemicals, sometimes they can be used judiciously or as a last resort, or um, there's conventional, which is traditional chemicals that can be used, and biorational, which is a more targeted uh, approach with using specific types of compounds. If you are going to use conventional chemicals, you should consult with the North Carolina Agricultural Chemicals Manual. It's available online. You can just search for it. They update it every year. And it will tell you what types of chemicals or what specific chemicals can be used on specific types of plants and crops. Biorational chemicals are kind of a new way of thinking about things. These are chemicals that are less universally toxic and target specific aspects of pest biology. So for example, diatomaceous earth can impact slugs and soft-bodied um, critters. Um, pheromones can be used together with sticky traps. They can be quite effective, but you must I give a caution. So for example, Japanese beetle traps work great. They do attract the beetles, they will trap them, but you don't want them in your yard unless you have a really large yard because they will continue to attract beetles to your yard. So you want your neighbor to use them. Um, and then there are other repellents, attractants, and anti-feeding agents that can be used as well. Now, genetics is, again, a great method for controlling certain problems. And we talked a little earlier about resistance. And again, resistance is great. Um, it's kind of part of genetics now in a different sense that we have multiple ways of, of getting uh, resistance. You have classical plant breeding, which is what was been done for many, many hundreds or thousands of years. But now today we also have genetically engineered pest resistance where they can isolate specific genes and put them into specific crops to make them protected against a particular pest. So that's a new method. There are also uh, sterile insect releases where they're trying to sterilize and have insects that have been bred to be sterile. They release these sterile insects into the environment. They mate with normal insects, but the offspring cannot, they, they, they can't produce offspring. And so that will reduce the insect population. So this is kind of on the new forefront of control measures. So what do you do to implement these steps in your yard? So again, you want to start healthy. Prevention is always great. You want to make sure anything you introduce into your yard is healthy, and you want to employ these different cultural methods to keep your yard healthy. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Next, you want to address problems early, early intervention. So Check things out, get rid of those caterpillars before they destroy your plant or before you're required to pull out some massive uh, chemical spray in order to control what's going on. So you want to address that issue, issue before it becomes a problem. So a stitch in time saves nine. And then record keeping. I think this is an important step. You want to know what to look for. And if you do, your future self will thank you when you come across that problem again. You'll know what worked. You'll know when to look for this problem so that you can keep an eye out and uh, address it as soon as possible. If you still have a problem, what do you do? You don't know what to do. So you can call the Master Gardener office, of course. So you can email us at mgardener at wake.gov or you can call our phone line on during the weekdays from 9 to 12 or 1 to 4. You can also check out the extension website, gardening.ces.ncsu.edu for all kinds of handouts on publications on different kinds of problems. So these are three ways you can look for additional help from the master gardeners. Um, <clears throat> I will say 
That emailing is also great because you can send pictures, which is often very helpful in identifying what the problem is. If that doesn't work, you can also turn to the plant disease and insect clinic at NC State. On their website, it tells you how to submit a sample. But in addition to that, you can go there and look up these bolos, be on the lookout. They have them by different months, so you know, hey, it's April, what's going on? They have lawn diseases, tomato diseases, other kinds of diseases, everything to look for that might be going on, and you might recognize what kind of problem you actually are having. So let's just quickly uh, reiterate what we're going to do to keep our yards healthy. We're going to start monitoring our yards. I love to go out and look at all my pretty flowers almost every day that it's nice out anyway. So this is what I do. That's how I found that problem on my um, azaleas. And just last week, my husband said, hey, what's wrong with this camellia? And it had that uh, um, camellia gall disease. It's the same one that affects uh, azaleas, but it's on camellias. And all you do is you simply pick off those funky growth the leaves get all swollen and they're like thick and three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional. You just pick them off and throw them away. And you want to make sure you do that before they start forming the spores. And so if you do it early, you won't have that problem again. So you want to monitor and sample your environment. You want to properly identify what the problem is. Learn to know what some of the common diseases are. Um, go to the plant disease insect clinic presentations and come to more of these presentations and learn about common diseases. Learn the host cycle and the biology. It will help you understand where to take steps to interfere with the disease or pest development. You want to establish an action threshold. Is it an economic threshold, a health one, or an aesthetic one? Is it okay to have a few spots on your Azaleas, is this disease going to progress to something worse if you don't take care of it? Or is it something that it's really not a problem and you can ignore? Or just take simple steps like picking off diseased leaves. You want to choose the appropriate combination of those management tactics we just discussed, whether they're cultural, physical, mechanical, chemical, biological. And of course, if you can start with a resistant variety, that's all the better. And then evaluate your results in a garden diary. Um, make sure that what you did, write it down. Then you know next year when it comes upon April again that you had this problem. Then you know to look for it. And you'll be able to take action even sooner and perhaps be more effective. So sometimes, no matter what we do, problems still occur. And I like this little cartoon. The guy says, I sprayed it for aphids spider mites, Japanese beetles, leafhopper thrips, mealybugs, Dutch elm disease, and caterpillars, a beaver got it. So sometimes no matter what you do, you're gonna lose a plant. And that can be very sad, but I also like to look at it as an opportunity to get something new. So you can get some favorite plant off your, your list of, of something you've always wanted. So look at it as an opportunity. So. Before I end, I do want to put in a brief plug for our gardener's guide month by month. This is a great guide that can tell you what to do in the garden for each month, help you look out for those different diseases, how to keep your garden healthy. It's got how to's and tips. It covers uh, these different areas for each month, trees, perennials, bulbs, annuals, herbs, vegetables, and lawns. And it is available at several local garden nurseries and also on this website, wakemastergardeners.org. And it's available, it's 20, I think it's $25 for um, in the nurseries and online it's $20 plus $5 shipping. So it's still $25, but it's beautifully illustrated by master gardeners. A huge team of master gardeners worked for a year, um, it was our pandemic project. Um, and so I just do highly recommend this. I think if you get one, you'll just love it. And so just again, here's the information of how to contact these different um, Master Gardener, uh, different ways to contact the Master Gardener office and the website. And with that, I am happy to try to answer any questions.
All righty. Well, there weren't too many questions, but we do have a few of them. Um, for starters, Marilyn was asking questions specific to the azalea caterpillars that you experienced on your azaleas. Mm -hmm. Do you know if those are native or exotic? Uh, I do not know that. Um, but I okay. do know that I never had the problem until last year, and hopefully I won't have it again this year. So, Okay. Well, Marilyn also made another comment about uh, about disposing of the caterpillars specifically. She was wondering if birds and fish eat them, if she can feed them to birds and fish rather than just killing them, throwing them away. Is that uh, I think it? that's a great idea. I don't know specifically, but I really can't imagine that they would not be available. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure birds would eat them anyway, so she can certainly try. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, she also asked, with regards to those specific caterpillars, what time of year is best to inspect for them? Um, I would have to consult my garden diary um, off the top of my head. I think it was it was a little bit later into the summer um, mm. that that they occurred. Sure. The spring. Sure. And I think that if you're periodically monitoring your garden, as you suggested, as one of the basic tenets of integrated pest management, then you'll surely see them when they happen. Exactly. Yeah. OK, uh, got another question from Marilyn. She says this might not be in your field, but do you have any experience with mosquito traps where you put a five gallon bucket of water in the yard with mosquito dunks and then a handful of rotting vegetation to attract the females to lay eggs there? Yes, I have heard this. I've heard that this is very effective. I've not tried it myself, um, but um, yes, I've heard that that is very effective. I think you want to use okay. hay or something like that. Awesome. Great. All righty. Do you have a link to scientifically tested info on what companion plantings really work and not just what's old wives' tales? I do not have a specific link on that, but what I would suggest is looking on um, the Extension website and see if they have a publication on that. Awesome, great, wonderful. Okay, and here's a good one. She says, I live in Wake County, not in the city, limits, and I'm not allowed to throw away any plant material in my trash. So what's a good way to dispose of diseased plant materials such as dead camellia blooms, et cetera? In the oh. compost pile, do you burn them? Do you bury them? That is a tough question. Okay. Uh, what I would do is I would put them in like a dark plastic trash bag and put them out in the sun. I know it's going to be nasty, but but that will kill what's in there. Um, I think that would be the best way. I would not put it in your compost pile. It, it's hard to make sure your compost is going to get hot enough to kill off the disease. So I, that's what I would do. I would solarize it in a trash bag. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good tip for sure. Okay, Jenny's asking, is there a way to prevent rust on oxalis? Um, that is a good question. I don't know exactly, but I have... Uh, I haven't seen it on Exalis, so I don't know. But um, I've heard using neem oil can be effective um, against some diseases, including rust. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay. So Kathy's asking, last year I had a horrible mealybug issue. Tried everything, tried removing them by hand, ended up disposing of most of my perennial and annual plants. Is this a common issue? And what other methods can reduce this problem? Oh, I, you know, it, the, these were outdoor plants that you had this problem? Yeah, I assume such. Huh. Her perennials um, and her annuals. So my guess is, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that sounds like certainly something where if you must, you might try some chemical control to see what's labeled for, for treating them. I've not heard of this as being a common problem, so I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Um, it might be that Again, your cultural conditions were somehow not favorable. Your plants were stressed in some way. Um, you know, if you've tried things like safer soap and different kinds of, of you know, um, soap sprays and that didn't work, you know, the next step is to just escalate to some other kind of chemical control or start over, like you said. Um, I don't know specifically. Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
Also, somebody asks, can spent camellia blooms be disposed of in waste in Wake County yard waste, healthy or diseased? I would think so. I don't think yeah. we, that as far as I know, you can't you could put things like that in your waste. I mean, they're they're you don't want to just throw them around in your yard. So I would think so, if it, as long as it's minimal. I don't think Absolutely. there's a rule against that. Yeah, for sure. It's yard waste. So put it in the yard waste receptacle. I think um, Marilyn's comment earlier was about you can't put your your plant waste into like the garbage, into what's getting sent to the landfill. So don't put your plant waste in the garbage. But if you for sure have a yard waste receptacle that your municipality is taking care of, then by all means, put them in there. OK, so William's saying I lost a knockout rose to rose rosette disease. Can I plant other types of roses in the same spot or just in the area generally? Okay. Um, I don't know specifically, but that's a case where you might want to look for resistant varieties. Mm. See if there are any. Yeah, definitely. And I think a good place to look for resistant varieties would be the rose garden at the JC Ralston Arboretum. We don't, we don't spray our roses for anything. If a, if a variety is struggling, we take it out and dispose of it and replace it with something else. So you can pretty much guarantee that everything we've got going out there has at least some level of resistance. Okay. Okay. So Tiffany's asking, are there any suggestions for Japanese beetles? Because they had a pretty invasion, pretty bad invasion last year. <laughs> yeah, I knock them into a bucket of soapy water. <laughs> I mean, I just you just have to make it your new hobby to go out every morning when they're kind of it's easier in the morning. They tend to be a little bit more sluggish in the morning and you just knock them into a bucket of soapy water. Um, that's really the best thing to do. Um, they're difficult to control and they like a lot of different plants. Um, I had a tough time last year as well. Um, I'm trying to remember, I bought a product. I didn't find it to be effective. I was reading that there was a certain type. It was a natural um, spray of different kinds of, of um, oils, uh, plant oils uh, to spray on your plant that was going to repel them. I tried that, it did not seem to work for me. Um, there's really not a lot you can do there. There are ways if you treat, they eat the grub, they, they are the grubs in your lawn. You can put down diseases to called milky spore disease in your lawn that yeah. helps control the grub population. Unfortunately, unless your whole neighborhood does it, it's really not going to be very effective. Yeah. They're a pest. <laughs> They're a big pest. For sure. And that's pretty much the case with all manners of controlling uh, the Japanese beetles is you can do what you can do. But if your neighbors aren't doing the same thing, then you're not really doing much, unfortunately. But hey, there's no reason you can't come together as a neighborhood and then just do a, a spreading of uh, milky spore disease because that and is and a also, great way. You could also, as a neighborhood, perhaps put traps towards the, you know, at the entry to your neighborhood, perhaps. Yeah, that would attract them there away from your yard. Absolutely. Teamwork makes the dream work. So, yeah. Um, all right. So Carolyn has a question uh, about, well, she says, do ants farm mealy bugs like they farm aphids might control the ants? And I thought this might be a good place to mention that uh, ants might be one of the signs that you have an aphid infestation because they do they do like each other. They are friends. And if you see that you've got aphids, you may also have ants. But if you see you have ants, you may also have aphids. So you may need to incorporate that into your monitoring. Yeah, I have not heard that about mealybugs. I, yeah, no, me neither. I don't, think so. I don't think they cause that exuding. That's what attracts the ants. Mm. Is that the, the aphids exude the sweet sugar that the ants harvest. So that, yeah. that's part of why they attract the ants. For sure. They sure do. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah. OK, so here's a question about ants. I have a huge anthill in my garden that I don't know what to do with. How can I deal with it? OK, I would first figure out what kind of ants. If they are fire ants, you want to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so if you say an ant hill, very frequently that is fire ants. But you, yeah. otherwise, ants can be very beneficial. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah. You can look up different controls for that. I don't yeah. know off the head, but I can tell you a pretty good one. We had a uh, 
we had a big gala at the garden over the weekend, this past weekend. We had a big old tent set up on there and we had an anthill that happened to materialize under that tent. We couldn't have an anthill under there for the gala. So we literally took boiling water and poured it down the anthill. That is a great way to deal with it. They don't like getting boiling water poured into their home. Go figure. I, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the science is behind that, but it, it seems to work rather effectively. So if you have, you know, if you're afraid of using chemicals and stuff, well, water is in fact a chemical, but this is one that is generally safe under most circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there are effective chemical controls as well, but again, Oh yeah, absolutely. Something that's least toxic is, is always preferable. Okay. So Marilyn's asking if I've lost a Daphne to my top throw root rot due to overwatering, can I ever plant another Daphne in that location? If I add a new mound of soil and permatil and don't overwater it, I've heard Phytophthora is always in the soil, but I've also heard don't ever put another susceptible plant there. Yeah, that's one of those, those fungi that has a very broad host range. Uh, if you've taken all those measures, I, I would just say maybe. I don't, I would say if you really want to try it, I'd start with a small one. So you don't put too much of an investment in it and see if it survives or just try to find another spot. Um, I mean, you know that it's a potential problem. It's just a risk you'd have to take. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I think we have just one final question here. What can you do to control vole damage? Oh, lovely. <laughs> we will be having a new publication on this soon. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I would suggest, um, I'm trying to think, uh, that's kind of so planting with permatil is one way or, or some type of gravel will help protect your roots um, is something that you can do. Um, you can try to eliminate their habitat. Um, if you see like mole tunnels, very frequently voles will use the mole tunnels. So if you stamp tamp them down, you can, there's different ways to sort of check to see what the pot, kind of population you have out there. I think, let's see, I think you can get a permit to trap them, but you can just kill, I don't remember the exact, wait, let me see, I think I have, what I have my notes from, we had a lecture on this just recently. I'm trying to remember where that, where it was. Um, no, I don't have that at my thing. Um, I'm sorry, I just can't think the answer to that. But there are information online if you go to that site for um, that I gave you about the continuing um, by that um, extension. You can can find some information on there for different controls for for voles. They are tricky, and I see somebody says cats. <laughs> I guess that's that's yeah. always an option. I love yeah. cats. I think that's a great one, but they can only. I use completely them. agree. That's a good strategy. It's a good place to start anyway. You can't have yeah. too many cats out of the garden. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that is all the questions we have time for today. So thank you so much, Cynthia, for pulling this chat together for us. I learned a lot. It was wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. I hope you all learned a bunch as well. And you are excited to go out into your gardens to monitor for pests to help mitigate their potential damages. So. Thank you all for joining us for this one. We're going to have another one next month as well, but I don't think we have a topic for that ironed out just yet. But bear with us. We will pick one out and we will certainly have another Master Gardener lecture on the 22nd of May at 10 a.m. So I hope we'll see you all there. Y'all take care. <laughs>